Well, hello and welcome to What Makes a Difference. And today we are talking with Judy Carroll and she is the accidental advocate. I think it's best off describing your introduction. Welcome. It's lovely to have you join us, Jilly. Hi, thank you. Probably quite a lot of people will be aware now of the conversations that you've been having and mm. how that came about. But I suppose from, from our standpoint, it would be worth kind of having a quick recap on that because I think it's important. I think it's really important. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, yes, thanks for the, the description. I, I describe myself as the accidental activist for the military bereaved community. And I suppose um, I thought I knew everything there was to know about being a military spouse. And um, I'd been a, um, an army wife for um, nearly 20 years through lots of six tours of Afghanistan. And my husband had served in Iraq and Bosnia and Northern Ireland before that. And I think you think you know all of the stuff around deployment and separation and raising children alone and mobility and all of those issues that we talk about in the military community. And then when my husband, Nick, was diagnosed with uh, stage four brain cancer during lockdown, I began to to really sort of inhabit a space that I really knew I, I knew very little about. And I had probably assumed that lots of things would swing into action to support both Nick, myself and our children through the pre-bereaved stage of, of his illness, but also that somehow... Um, things would be well supported and seamless after his death. And actually, I was quite horrified to discover that a lot of the mechanisms that you would imagine might be in place for a bereaved military family are not. And um, this led me to really kind of open out the conversation about what happens to um, armed forces families who experience a bereavement, whether that's of the serving person or of losing a child or young soldiers losing a parent. And actually, I, I realised that there was a lot to do in opening up the conversation and talking about it and really trying to look at what support is and isn't available. So when we when we first had a chat, Jilly, I think we'd reached out to you because we saw your initial post on LinkedIn that yeah. I suppose kind of really gathered all of the attention and started that snowball that has grown and grown and grown since then, and rightly so. And I think what really jumped out at us is that, is that the transition piece, it tends to be very functional, but whether that's leaving the military or a death within that community that then results in others having to leave that community, that transition piece is exactly what you're talking about, where the emotional support just isn't catered for. And in, in your case, actually, the functional piece, the practicalities also were sadly lacking as well in terms of that transition, that handover, you could see in terms of circumstances too. And that was really why we wanted to have that conversation with you because that's really, really important. It's critical. Given that these are life choices that people make when they join the military. I think that's the difference between being bereaved within the military environment and being bereaved within the civilian environment. And what happens, I think, is that there are multiple layers of loss that you will experience as a result of being bereaved as part of the military community, especially as a spouse and more importantly, as a child of a serving person. And what I hadn't really factored in and lots of spouses who I've spoken to following on from the, the original LinkedIn post, which I think and the video has now been viewed over a million times. So this has clearly garnered a lot of uh, interest and discussion and that's simply because there is this sort of lack of understanding about what actually does happen who does what what is the responsibility of the MOD what people think that the armed forces charity sector does and doesn't do or is capable of doing um, and 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 there's this sort of gray space really that exists between being a serving person or part of a serving family 
or being a veteran. And bereaved families don't sit into either of those categories. So when we talk about transition, we tend to talk about veterans transitioning out of the armed forces. But there is no transition for bereaved families and for children who lose a parent while serving. Um, quite often, they not only lose the parent, but if they're living in service family accommodation, they will lose their home, whether that's within 93 days or that can be extended to two years as the policy states. Then they're losing a parent, a home, quite often the school, if they're in receipt of CEA and at the end of that key stage of education, then they're going to lose the school place. And if you have to move, then of course the children also have to move school, which means that they are also losing their peer group, their friendships, their, the, the continuity of their school life. And the other thing that we talk about a lot when we're talking about veterans is that loss of identity. And so service children who are bereaved suddenly don't know if they're service children anymore and they don't quite know where they fit in the world and that creates in my experience and in my recent understanding and having talked to lots and lots of other families this triple quadruple layer of vulnerability around these members of the armed forces community because at the time the clock ticks past midnight and the serving person dies then that's that you are now part of the JCCC process and that is designed to um, to extract from from the family as efficiently as possible, and I've actually heard that terminology being used um, from the MOD. So, when you look at outcomes and and tracking methods for what actually happens to those children, and I'm sure lots of people who are listening to this um, have served and have had children while serving, and the assumption probably is that your family will be fully supported and looked after for as long as it takes. But we're not America and that does not happen here. And that's why um, I'm compelled with 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 a group of extremely focused um, professionals who are now addressing this on looking at what a sensible um, transition looks like for bereaved families, because the, the one that exists currently it, it's not good enough and it's not working. And it makes me extremely fearful um, for the children and young people who grow up having been ejected from the armed forces community without the right kind of sustain sustainable support. Yeah. So could you explain to people who don't know what the JCC is, please? The JCCC. Yeah, JCCC, yeah. Yeah, so that is basically, that's the um, process, the joint... Um, compassionate and casualty cell. Um, it's the part of the process that the MOD puts in place for bereaved um, families. It's for the injured and sick and the seriously injured and sick. So it applies if you have um, if you have an accident or if there's a mm. uh, if you're killed in action or in fact the same um, cell actually looks after those with um, terminally ill serving personnel and that's a real area I think that we need to to explore and to make considerably better not just for the serving person but also for yeah. the family who are supporting that particular exit. Definitely because people would have as you said quite rightly to you people assume that after 20 years of being in Iraq, Afghanistan or wherever else on tour that uh, all this would be in place. People can go there's your point of reference, signposted there, and they will pick up the help you pick up the pieces and help you move on in that process as best they can. Mm. So I think if you Google it, there is a JSP which tells you what the po process is and what the policy is. If you were to go inside uh, the MOD, they would tell you that their policies are working just fine and that um, they have something called a purple pack, which they issue to families and that you are given a visiting officer and they help you to transition out. And that may be the case in some parts of the service, bearing in mind that we're talking about a tri-service organization where the Royal Marines uh, do it very differently than the Navy who do it very differently to the RAF who then do it very differently to the Army. And you have to also factor in the Army has a regimental structure whereby each of the regiments may well do things differently. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not in a position to say that every single person doesn't have the correct support. But what I am in a position to say 
is that the support that exists is process driven and it is policy driven and it doesn't land on the side of the bereaved family. It lands on the side of what the MOD delivers as, as, does, as much government policy does and it doesn't actually match the lived experience of many of the families who are experiencing bereavement. That's not just uh, the serving person being bereaved, but it's also um, one of my steering group members um, who will be coming to the cabinet office with me on the 15th of May. Um, he lost his daughter um, whilst he was serving. She took her own life whilst he was serving with the army and he was out in the States at the time. And that resulted in him not accessing or being given the right um, processes and the right support and ultimately him being medically downgraded and discharged from the army so again you are looking at levels of vulnerability mm -hmm. which affect things like financial stability job security mental health long yeah. and being able to thrive so it, it there really is a, a problem across the board in how we support bereavement in in the armed forces community and how we talk about it and how we actually understand it. So I think there's a lot of gaps. So there's a lot of, in. So with all that, there'll be a lot of, say, sanctuary trauma, betrayal trauma, all that grief, loss, and the whole host of things that go along with that. Mm -hmm. That just builds up into a significant wound for those individuals. I think so. And I think the other issue is if you are living within the armed forces community and you've experienced yourself, then you'll know it's all encompassing, mm. that it isn't a job that you go to nine to five and then you come home again and you go out with your friends and your family live nearby. You are actually living within a separate community, quite often hundreds of miles from home, without your network of support. Um, without the, the the friends that you grew up with as a child, um, that you've probably moved every couple of years, if you're army for sure, less so if you're if you're navy or, or um, RAF, but that your normal um, scaffolding that would be available to you from your local community and from your family and friends is much more remote and difficult to access yes. um, when you're within the armed forces community. So there is a it would be easy to say, yes, but why is it any different for bereaved military families? Well, it's different because you're living in that community. You've probably been away from home for several years and that your links to your normal support um, pathways really are fractured. And it's very difficult to kind of place yourself back within those. And I have really big concerns about the children of of um bereaved personnel for all the reasons we talked about at the beginning that they're actually going to question their own identity also the sacrifice that has been made in their name mm -hmm. and what they've lost for life um my 12 my, my youngest daughter was 12 when Nick died and and she said the other day you know I'm really proud of what he did but I'm gonna have to to live with not really understanding our lives um, and what what we did and what he sacrificed for the rest of my life and that's a lot for a 12 year old to yeah. to take on board and I think to say that there is a policy in place that is working or to say that some of the armed forces charities do various pieces of of work and don't get me wrong there are some that are trying very hard to do some very good work it's still not enough and we need to think about this systemically and holistically in order to make sure that the next generation, so the children of um, serving personnel who have died, are not in this acutely vulnerable position. Well, you could argue that actually the, the charity sector should be the area of last resort, not mm -hmm. the support network for something that is so pivotal. And I think I'm going to draw attention back to the difference between that experience in a military community and a civilian community, and very rightly, as you say, it's about what the lifestyle within the military does to your civilian networks. Mm -hmm. If you're in there for a prolonged period of time, your civilian network becomes very, very distanced. So your wraparound community is the very community that suddenly you're excluded from, that you're no longer a part of. So your support yeah. network 
evaporates at the same time as your loved one. Yeah. And if you look at a bereavement in civilian life, as you say, there's not that same level of upheaval. And the support network, your friends, your family are still there in the vicinity around about. And it's hard enough dealing with that in that scenario. Mm. But when you're when you're now also trying to build or navigate an entirely new community in the middle of a bereavement for you and your family, then that's 10 times harder. I think also, for me, and I don't know what you, th- you think about it, Jilly, it also sometimes I think undervalues the importance of the support that the family and the spouse give to the serving member <laughs> of that family in that unit. And yeah. how much they enable and how much they sacrifice to provide that support network, the impact on them over the course of the career, even before it comes to the point of bereavement. I think that's true. And I think you sort of take it on the chin as a as a military spouse, but nobody says at the beginning of that experience, OK, um, this is what's going to happen. People say to me all the time, well, you must have known what to expect when you when you married into the army and of course you don't because how would you 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 get married because you fall in love with somebody and you probably romanticize some elements of it and think that it's all going to be hunky-dory and actually some of it's great fun and and you get lots of opportunities and it isn't all doom and gloom but predominantly um the spouses make a massive contribution in uh, raising the children quite often on their own, um, taking a back seat with their careers. And I spent years doing jobs that, you know, I really didn't want to be doing. But that was that was all that was available to me in moving every couple of years. Um, but then for us, you know, with with the repeat tours of Afghanistan, the first point of contact for that serving person who comes back from Afghanistan and they're away from their their colleagues and their comrades is the spouse. And the spouse is usually the first line of support for those soldiers who may have experienced terrible things while on operations, whether they've developing PTSD or or perhaps have alcohol abuse issues because of, of their experiences. And also there's there's also, also that disconnect of um managing a family unit and then having your serving person coming back in and you know disrupting the way that you stack the dishwasher I mean I make light of it but you know it's a very different and unique way and if the armed forces are as concerned about retention as they say they are then the obvious place for me to highlight is how are you better supporting Mm-hmm. Uh, and I hate to use the word support, but how are you better facilitating healthy marriages and family units? Because I'd like to move away as much as I can from the word welfare and support, because that implies a kind of dependence culture mm-hmm. from the spouse. Yeah. Actually, thankfully, we've got rid of the word dependent now. Hallelujah. Um, but I think I think there isn't enough real insight into the intensity of being a military spouse particularly through operational periods and also how that 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 impacts on your family life so when when all of that does disappear when when you're bereaved you begin to ask a lot of questions about what happened there for the last you know 15 or 20 years and how what kind of shape does that leave my family in and in my case I looked at my family, the th- myself and the two children, and thought, well, we're fractured now and we're cast aside because everything that we've supported Nick in his career and the armed forces has been cast aside and we're just kind of left now. We're, we're just a number. There is no tracking of our health or well-being or the outcomes for our children. And I know that Nick, if he were here, would be deeply unhappy about that. And it is for that reason that I think I have to be brave and and talk about these things so that we can make it better for other families who are sadly going to experience this, but also for serving personnel who, young soldiers who lose their mums and don't get the right support or, or families who lose their children and don't get the correct support. 
you know, we cannot shy away from death. It happens to all of us. But what we can do is to make it um, a place where people can talk about it safely and be supported until they're fully capable of being functional and in the military terminology operational again. Going back to what you're saying about retention, Ali, we were looking through is some documentation about what's out there support-wise and how do other countries do things. The Australians, they know that military families and they are really big on helping them, supporting them, because they want those children of those parents to go in to join the forces because that's one of their biggest recruiting tools they've got. So you think the MOD would be wise to this and utilise the families to recruit into the forces itself? Mm. I think the problem is... <sighs> I think societally, how we think about our veterans and our bereaved community it is not aligned with countries like Australia and America. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually starting to do some quite important work with TAPS in the States, which yeah. is the uh, Tragedy and Assistance Programme for Survivors. And that is run, uh, the chief executive is a, is a very, very impressive woman called Bonnie Carroll. And Bonnie, I had the privilege of hosting Bonnie at, at Remembrance last year. And she built that community up really from the ground 30 years ago when she lost her husband. Mm -hmm. But I think the difference is, is that we don't, they don't have an anxiety around veterans transitioning out of the armed forces and into the workplace, for example, that, that we do, that some charities do are seeking and doing some very good work in, in, in meeting the needs of at the gaps that that exist there but we're not at the point here in this country where we're there yet and secondly we then have the additional problem of bereaved families nobody quite knows what to do with them or if in fact they should even have a seat at the table or if in fact we should just hide them away and give them a small pension and then hope that's the end of that because that's what we currently do. And I think the States and Australia are very good at not doing that and to appreciating that we served too and the children served too because mm. of the lifestyle that they lived. And I think we can only get better at that when we talk about it. And so many people have come to me and said, we just didn't know. Members of the armed forces, we didn't realize. We thought the process, well, we didn't know. what. The, in fact, we haven't dared to think about it. So there is a bit of head in the sand about if you're joining the armed forces or if you're in it, you don't really want to think about, as my husband would say, getting the good news. You just don't want to think about that because it's counterintuitive to, to your role and you're trained out of thinking in that way. But I imagine if I spoke at, uh, to all of the new recruits coming in and their families, um, things might be slightly different because I would love it if people did actually think that the worst might happen and that they would get their financial affairs in order and that they would perhaps be more empathetic and understanding to people who experience all the different types of bereavement while serving. I think probably one of the biggest challenges that we have in the UK is under-reporting mm -hmm. because when you look at the, the military and veteran community in general, the level of information that you can look at in terms of outcomes for a number of different measures is almost non-existent. It's so difficult to find that it's, and when you do, it's incredibly basic, very short term in terms of its window of study. And that means that the, the impact of that is also diluted. You know, if we don't measure it, how do we know there's an issue and how do we know that there's something we need to address? And it's almost kind of like, it's, it's almost like an intentional blindness because if I don't look, then I, I'm not responsible and I don't have to act. If I don't know, I'm not obliged to put in that support or address the issue. And yeah, you're right. You look at things like Australia, America, Canada, they're 10 years ahead of us in terms of the information they gather. Trying to find the information, even track the number of bereaved families and the outcomes for the children. Where would you even start? Well, that's one of the MOD. The things that the MOD says currently is that the cabinet office doesn't hold any statistics on their dashboard about the numbers of deaths in service. And that's only the tip of the iceberg because that's talking about service personnel who die in service. That isn't even referring to 
families who lose a child. It doesn't talk about soldiers who lose a parent um, or a sibling or a comrade. I can remember Nick losing one of his closest friends when he was in Lashkagar in uh, in Afghanistan. And um, it just being sort of, you know, well, finally when he came home from that tour, he began to sort of unpick some aspects of it, but it wasn't really encouraged to do that. Mm-hmm. And now we wonder why we have PTSD that is rife amongst our, our community. And now we're also beginning to see that we have spouses with PTSD too. Um, and that makes me wonder about when there'll be a study about the children of these spouses and serving personnel. Do they also have PTSD or what other mental health issues have been suppressed as a result of that? So I think you're right. We need to track. We need to start getting the data together. And there's an opportunity for a, you know, Northumbria or Anglia Ruskin or King's Military Mental Health to say, right, we're going to start looking at the bereaved community and we're going to get some research together, which really helps us to as to map the need, if you like. And Northumbria have done a, a short research project um, last year on lo- social isolation and loneliness that's experienced by widows. But then, of course, that's just widows. That isn't widowers. That isn't all the other children. That isn't all the other people that we've talked about. And that tends to be a very um, small community. So Research is definitely a component of what we need, but I'm also mindful that research will take one, two and three years to get the kind of mapping that we would require. And that during that time, bereavement is still happening every day. And I actually had a very good meeting um, last week with John Healy, the Shadow Defence Secretary, and Luke Pollard, the Shadow Veterans Minister. And I have also met with their equivalents, in the Tory party, not Grant Shapps, because I haven't, he hasn't quite responded to any of my my emails just yet. But John Healy's view was very much that it's now time to renew our promise to the armed forces community and to look at our promise with bereaved families and to unpick that. And he was very much of the view that we don't need a massive piece of research. What we need, we know that there is a problem. We, we, can, we can easily find out who that community are with not too much difficulty. And then we can get on and start planning those sensible pathways of support with organizations such as the NHS, um, who are involved in, very involved in my task group. I've got some excellent people from the NHS. I've got nine NHS trusts who are currently involved in developing that work and the MOD and COBSIO charity members if they wish. Um, and, and others who feel that, that you know, this is relevant to them. And to me, it's about bringing everybody together as a force multiplier in order to be able to get the job done. Otherwise, I'm going to just be rattling around mm-hmm. um, for years, not actually getting the job done. And I think for every day that goes past, I know that there's another family who, who need not just signposting, because we know that doesn't work in the long term, but they need to access sustainable support, but also be part of a valued community. And that's the key. It's about valuing bereaved families who have who have lost somebody while serving. It can feel like once you've left, the door's locked behind you, and that's it. No access to anything, and you're you're just nobody on the street, as you said beforehand, Judy. It's just a number. I think that's true, and I think for me, I don't. You know, it took me a couple of years to really start talking about this because I didn't really know how I felt about it. I felt. I felt angry for Nick. I felt really angry for Nick that, that you know, he died and he didn't get the best support that he could have whilst he was dying in service. And I had to fight very hard to get certain things in place. Then I felt angry for my children because I thought, you know, they were born into the Afghan conflict. They were both born whilst Nick was away in Afghanistan. And they've only ever known their lives as being service children. And so... This is not about monetarizing either. So, you know, yes, the pensions need to be reviewed because they're not good enough. Yes, the way that we support our bereaved service children up to the age of 18, unless they go into full time education and then financially will continue to support them. That needs to change because other, you know, 
children in care, for example, are supported up to the age of 25. So we need to have a think about the policy around children and young people and, and what we're actually preventing them from achieving and not just saying that access to higher education is the only way that we're going to continue to support our service children because that feels very wrong to me, particularly if you have a child with special educational needs or just does not wish to go to university and wants to pursue a different route, then it needs to be equitable and much fairer. Um, but uh, so I think, yes, I felt angry and and unsupported and and not just, you know, and I'm, I'm fairly strong. I kind of, I'm, you know, I'm not in a position of acute vulnerability. I'm able to articulate, I hope, for other members of the bereaved community. But it's when I start to think about those who are less able to articulate, who have families with complex needs, who are non-UK families, for example, who who just have situations that are not straightforward. I, I have had emails and phone calls with people who are struggling 10, 15, 20 years later because they just didn't get the right pathway to allow them to thrive. And that's what I'm interested in, mm -hmm. is how do we make sure that our, that our bereaved community has the same opportunities despite what they've lost to everybody else? And I think that's what made me sort of decide, right, you know, I know I'm going to come in for a lot of flack. I know that there are going to be certain statutory authorities that are going to disagree with me. They're going to think that their policy is working and there's going to be other people who are jumping up and down saying we're already doing this work and isn't it enough? And my answer to that is no, it is not enough. We've still got an awful lot to do. I think sometimes they use the wrong metrics and they fail to recognise that this isn't a job. It's much, much more than a job. Yeah. This is a community. Yeah. And it's, as, you, as Julie mentioned earlier, it's all encompassing. It is all encompassing. And that means that that impacts on every aspect of the lives. And if all of that changes in one fell swoop, it has that that awareness has to be there. But even even beyond, even if you take aside a bereavement situation, I still don't think that there's enough support or recognition for the families, for the children, recognizing the impact on their futures on their opportunities, on their experiences. And yes, there are benefits, but there are also significant challenges in terms of their opportunities, their education, their experiences, you know, that, that can have long lasting effects if it's if the support isn't there at the right time. But that has to be considered if you're going to operate as a community and rely on that structure as part of the support network. And it's a vital one. I think when we're talking about, I have a particular concern about children and young people who are bereaved by suicide as well. Mm -hmm. And we still don't have all the information in place and people are much more willing to talk about it now than, than ever before. And there's some excellent work being done. I was at an event in Parliament last week where Dr. Sharon was, you know, has provided some guides around this. Which, which is brilliant, and it means that we can start talking about it in an armed forces context. But we still don't really know what happens to the, the brains of children and young people who experience that sort of trauma and they lose a parent to suicide. And, and I, I just have a sense, and I'm not a doctor, that what happens to their coping mechanisms is not good and that actually they become incredibly vulnerable. And again, uh, two me three members of my steering group, my task force, have been bereaved by suicide. And that is a massive concern for those mothers of those children. That uh, And what is the support pathways for those children? Well, there aren't any at the moment. And, you know, we can't allow that just to fester knowing and sensing as mothers that this is going to be a problem. Mothers are usually right, I think, about these kinds of things. But we really need to start thinking about that very, very quickly, particularly when we hear stats coming out um, last week that four to five veterans are taking their lives a week. Yeah, um, you yeah. know, people will say that's no different to the civilian statistics. 
I heard um, somebody say that in the news last week, and perhaps it isn't, but it's still far too high. And it is so intertwined in the armed forces with with your um, identity and what it is you've been trained to do. And I am very fearful for the impact that has on those children and young people. Yeah. And I would say that rather than coping mechanisms, mechanisms you want these children to, to thrive. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. successful lives. I think they deserve it. They and do, don't they? they? I know that my husband, the most important thing to him when he was dying was that he said to me, promise me, you know, that um, that the children will be okay. And of course I promised him because it's very, very important that he could die knowing that his girls were going to, to thrive. But I have had to have some battles to make sure that that is the case. You know, my my girls, you know, could, could no longer access CEA at the end of their GCSE. So that meant... For a year, I had one child in school in Dorset and the other one at school in Hampshire because that was the nearest school place that I could access for my older child while the younger child finished, which meant that we had a three and a half hour round trip every day to get them both to school and to get them through their GCSEs, you know, fairly soon afterwards, after Nick died the first one and then the second one last year. And the super strength and resilience as a parent you have to have to cope with that, not just um, the bereavement and supporting your children through that, because the other thing I'd really like to say to the policymakers and to anybody that really wants to do something to help is that grief is not linear for children and grief is certainly not linear for teenagers. So I had one child who grieved straight away and loudly and angrily and emotionally as you would expect and then the younger one who decided to leave it for a couple of years and not look at it because it was far too painful and she has only in the last few weeks started to explore that grief now so to to kind of put ring, a time and a ring fence around anybody's grief and I haven't even begun to explore my own yet because you know, I was I was looking after my husband and then then looking after the children and moving house and moving schools and and settling into a new city where I knew nobody. It's about, you know, making sure that everyone is OK, which is the job that the parents left behind do is really, really difficult. And it's made more difficult by that lack of community and that real lack of of uh, understanding and the fact that, you know, you're going it alone. I moved to a city where I knew no one and, you know, I still don't really know anybody, but my girls are going to school every day. They, they did extremely well in their GCSEs. They, one is about to sit her A-levels, you know, and that is hard to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, people sort of say things like, oh, you're so strong. And it, it's got nothing to do with that. <laughs> it's just that you've got to keep going as the surviving parent. And that's in in spite of your lack of community or your lack of support. And saying, have you reached out to X, Y and Z charity infuriates me because they're not going to fix any of this. That You know, it's not a sticking plaster that we're looking for or welfare support. It's just a better systemic approach to accessing our healthcare, accessing a new home, moving house, job hunting, making sure that the children, you know, have have some something, somebody just saying, are, are they okay? I mean, I phoned up my husband's regiment and said, after a year, would you like to know how we are? Because you haven't called us once mm -hmm. to find out how we are or where we are. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the wrong way around. Yeah. I think in this country, we're pretty bad at talking about grief and death. And we're very awkward in that space. It's like, oh, how are you today kind of thing? And that's all we really want to talk about. It's the awkward pat on the shoulder, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> but it's, I think, yeah, in that situation, about all that you can do is cope and keep going. But as you rightly say, Julie, where's the space that you actually really need for the actual grieving itself. 
when everything is there and not only is everything has everything that's the support network gone you've also got the added pressure of recreating that support network of trying to build a community from scratch and that's different again because when you move within the military in a way you're moving within an extended community that is used to that, that has processes, that has practices and behaviours and culture in place that recognises that, that again wraps around you quite quickly. But that doesn't exist in a civilian community where where yeah. they're not necessarily used to that transition process, where you are very much unusual compared to the rest of the community. Whereas when you move within the military, that's so normal that that change itself is normal too. So everybody knows how to respond to it. Yeah, it's true. And even little things like, uh, I don't know, for, uh, trying to get a dentist. I mean, that's one of the smallest hurdles that we had to overcome. But I remember going into battle with the dental practice near to where we moved to. I mean, literally a pitch battle where I thought, I'm not going to lose this. I'm going to make damn sure we get a place on this NHS dentist waiting list. Um, and, and they referred to themselves as a veteran friendly practice, but they still didn't want to take the children and I on their NHS list. And so I was not willing to let that go. You know, I took that right up to their board to say, we did not choose to be here in this location. We are here because we've had to move. And why should we not have access to an NHS dentist because of the situation that we find ourselves in? And that's the same for school places. And that is also the same for families moving into um, social housing or, you know, th there's an assumption that you get paid this massive lump sum, which is enough to buy a house. And it is not. So <laughs> you're, you are left in a position where you've got to make lots of difficult financial decisions, too. So. Let's just keep talking about it and opening up some of these areas and hopefully people will want to to get involved and to really look at the reality um, that 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 being being a bereaved military family presents you with. I think there's also there's almost like a, a labeling issue as well. Because that's that's part of the identity, isn't it? Is is which category, which community do you fit into? Because for the service labour, when they leave the military, then there's the veteran community. While, ha while there's a lot that could improve in that, actually there's still that consistency of understanding of culture and you've got a choice over whether you engage in that. But for the bereaved spouse and the bereaved child, what is the community that you then become a member of? Because there's no formal structure for that, no, no placement within that at all. And that means then where are it's the grey space, isn't it? It's like you're kind of in no man's land between the two. And there are, you know, there's the widows associations that do very good comradeship work for those who want to access, um, you know, an, an annual conference or they want to be part of a WhatsApp group. And the Army Widows Association, you know, reached out to me very quickly and um, because of them it means that I can go and meet them at Remembrance and we can walk together um, um, at the Cenotaph which for me has been extremely helpful. Um, I don't necessarily get involved with everything that they do and I know that the different widows associations do different things but that's only for a particular group of of widows. Um, Scotty's Little Soldiers does some really good work in providing um, that connection to the armed forces for military children. And they do great things like sending out vouchers and bereaved service children are now able to also attend an event at Remembrance. And they do a, a good job and provide support. But, you know, they have one, they have one counsellor, one and we need many, many more than one. And that's a funding issue for them. And one that I hope me talking about will, will help them to access some more funds too. So there are pockets of understanding, I would say. Um, but that doesn't fix the problem. Yeah. As, as you mentioned in that talk we had a few weeks ago, is getting around that table and you're heading that table up and people come to you. 
brought up discussion about how they collaborate, how these little pockets form into bigger pockets. I have found that, I mean, I'm just blown away by the amount of anguish and anger and grief and willingness to support that has come out of this tiny bit of social media activism and it's only on one platform it's not like I've got a Twitter campaign going or you know I haven't got time I'm a I'm a mother of of two children and four dogs and two cats and and I've got a full-time job so I haven't actually got time to sort of you know do this as professionally as I would like to yet but you know we have now launched beyond the wire.org.uk which I'm really proud of in the last few weeks and that is bringing together um people that want to develop particular pathways of support and I really hope that those who work in the bereaved space or not even in the bereaved space who just want to help I had an extremely brilliant conversation with a chap earlier on who's developing a platform of easy access support um, like a through life platform for the veterans community and he wants to include the bereaved community in there so it's about bringing together those ideas and and expressions of positivity that I'm really really interested in we can talk about how hard it is until the cows come home and it will still be hard it's not going to become suddenly easy um but what we can do I think is harness this incredible momentum that we now have for good and I know lots of people who work in the charity sector say that and I've worked in the charity sector for a long time so of course I'm going to say that but I genuinely believe because people are so good and positive in the main. And yeah, if you'd like to help uh, and get on board with our campaigning and the work that we're doing, then please get in touch at info at, did I call it, uh, sorry, it's beyondthewire.org.uk. We thought yeah, very we'll carefully. Yeah, we'll the show notes for you. Yeah, info at beyondthewire.org.uk. And we've, uh, we're really proud of that. And it's hopefully that's going to be a hub of, developing and bringing together best practice and just bringing together bereaved community with the bereaved community. Well, I think what I'd, I'd like to say is that given the size and scope and reach of that post, Jilly, I think that says it all in terms of the size of the need and the, the desire for change. Because if people didn't think that that was valid, that that was something that had to, that something had to happen about, it wouldn't have had that impact. And look at the size of the impact, look at the size and the number of reposts, the number of, of impressions, the number of comments, the number of shares. Mm. That alone tells you how essential it is that this happens and that something drastic is done, something different happens as an outcome of that. Mm. I know it's been great and I've, I've put a couple more posts up subsequently that have had, you know, equal um kind of interest i think the video of nick and the children was particularly impactful to people because they they're used to seeing these reunion videos of of military families coming back together and and but the reality of that is is sometimes different to what you see so yeah i i'm i'm hopeful I'm, i remain really hopeful and Thanks to people like you as well, I can I can tell people's not just my own story, but but I can give a voice to everybody else, and we you know we can do something. I really I really genuinely believe that we can, and people have to be brave and step outside what they think they're doing well, and be given the opportunity to to say, okay, maybe we've done it always this way, but let's let's think differently, like you say, and and that's what I'm aiming for. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're holding up that mirror to their practices. I am. I'm also saying thank you for the work that you've yeah. tried to do and thank you for listening, but there's still a lot to do. So let's leave behind the hats that we usually wear and, and move forward. That's okay, but we can do better. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So... Just to, to, I suppose, to, to close out, Jilly, what would you like everybody to be aware of or pay attention to from this to take note of? Is there anything we can do in terms of 
maybe raising awareness, people getting if the people want to get in touch, if you if they resonate with what's happened to you and they want to, they want to add their voice, you know, to start to build that information. How what would they do? That's really kind. Thank you. So I'd really like you uh, to get in touch with us at beyondthewire.org.uk. Make sure you put the UK and otherwise you'll end up at a horse charity in America and we don't want that. <laughs> um, so if you or you can find me on LinkedIn, Jilly Corral, if that's easier. And just come and tell me what you want to do to help and support. Don't do that thing that people always say when somebody dies is, if you need me, you know where to get hold of me or what can I do? That's what people always say when there's been a bereavement. Come and tell me what you'd like to do to make the difference. And yeah. We'll, we'll bring it on. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Shirley, for your time. Thank oh, you. Thank you Thanks. both. It's a real pleasure to speak to you, and I'm really grateful for the fact that you were amongst the first people to get in touch with me and see how you could how you could support. So thank you very much. You're absolutely. You're very welcome. Thank you, Julie.